Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Cocktails and Rocktails with me, your most notorious groupie, Alice Rouse, author of We've Got Tonight, The Life and Times of Me, and where these other books right here, where you can get all that down in the description. So go down like it's the back lounge. <laughs> and as always, you guys, thank you so much for all the love, all the support, all the amazing friendships here. You guys, I just cannot tell you how much you make my day, how much you make me stronger when I am not having a particularly great day. So thank you so much for the love, the support, for having my back. You guys are awesome. Welcome to the new family. You're going to love it here. Converse with the other ladies down in the comments. We've got a lot of really cool people down there. Other 80s groupies, current groupies, different, you know, family experiences, Check it out, you guys. Converse, be part of the family, mingle, because that's what we do in rock and roll, right? But just really, truly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys so, so much for the love and support. It truly means the world to me every day. And speaking of meaning the world to me, some of you know here, I've got a second book that I've been working on and off for several years, and there's a reason for it, but today we're going to find out because I'm going to do a little reading from it. Yeah, something we haven't heard before. And I'm kind of refilming, so I've already opened it up. But today we're having the Boulevard Whiskey Stout. You guys, this is so good. It's got 11.8% alcohol. It's 32 IBUs. If you don't know what IBUs are, they are meant to measure the bitterness, the kind of hop rating. The higher, obviously, the more hoppy, the more bitter this is going to be. So Stout's going to be in the low range. And all right, so everybody, kick up your feet, grab your boulevards, and let's have a little cocktails and rocktails. Cheers, big ears. Mm. It's so good. Like, if you like a year round stout and you don't want to wait for the specialty beers like the Firestone Parabola or, you know, Bourbon County, any of that, this is your go to just everyday whiskey stout. Just easy drinking, not super heavy, not overwhelming aged on the whiskey so it's a really great balance and speaking of great balance okay so when I first started writing the second book and she was I really kind of and I'm still drawn to it I'm still kind of torn between it because the original concept for my second book was to put everything the more emotional side the more personal private intimate moments good and bad and I don't talk about not talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll intimate, because that's what my first book was all about. But so my second book kind of being the more emotional side, the roller coasters that I went through with different guys was going to be a fictional character based on my reality. And it kind of fo fo blah, 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 focused around these two different people, Jonesy James and Shayna who were both in two separate bands. Shayna started out as a young groupie. Jonesy, you know, total character and stuff. So it was going to be kind of based off, you know, what I was, I had gone through privately and emotionally with different rock stars. Kind of letting myself show you guys that side of my life in rock and roll, but kind of at the same time protecting it and leaving you guessing, which can be fun what happened with who and who's this based on and really like the characters are kind of amalgamated the different rock stars are amalgamated from different musicians I know some of their history that I know some of their, their things so this is what I'm going to read to you today I'm going to read to you the character breakdowns that I made to kind of get myself writing because if you are writing a more fictional then you really kind of want to develop a little character maybe the main character maybe what's happening to her why the book is being written why her story is being told so this is kind of what I'm doing so we're going to start with the um like I said the character breakdown this is probably going to be a two-part series so I can read because I don't have that much writ written for I have like a chapter and a half really different ideas and outlines what I want to do with the fictional based on my reality. So this is the character breakdown. So Jonesy James. 
Just put it down there in the comments. You know who those names are an amalgamation of. So birth name, James Bartholomew Arthur St. Jones. Dirty blonde hair with aqua blue eyes. He was the kind of bloke that could sell you the shittiest car in the lot while I'm using a digit on your wife under the table. Talent at raw, talent at raw emotion, which made his songs, the songs he wrote, so brilliant. Posh by birth with a rebellious, druggy edge. Grew up in the old town part of Clapham in London. Lived with his father and half-sister, Hugo St. James and Hyacinth. In a grand private house left over from the Victorian days when the neighborhood was littered with high society and majestic manners. During his childhood, Clapham had trans transformed into an odd mix of council flats and isolated old money. His mother, Bettina, was the daughter of a gypsy woman and the product of a boss meets employee affair, and she had abandoned him and his father when he was four years old. His father told Jonesy that his mother had died to save him from the pain of abandonment. Now, if we've all watched the movie Pistol, taken, adapted from Steve Jones's biography, Lonely Boy, we can see where, and keep in mind, I wrote this probably back started writing in this in 2014 so this is long before because I knew Steve for five years and he had said a couple things about his mother a couple times you know when I was over at his house and he played the machine and there's his mom first time in ages but anyway so we can all tell who that part of the personality of the character is based on okay da 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 Hugo maintained the family centuries-old business of an industrial construction and architectural landscaping, allowing for a very comfortable life along with a substantial inheritance that would one day become his and his sister's. Hyacinth would, would eventually become the bass player of future wife Shana's band, Nancy Pants, which is, now, which is how Shana and Jonesy would meet. He picked up the guitar and singing and singing as a way to pass the long days without his father. His aunt, Margaret St. Jones, would come periodically and stay long periods, bearing gifts of musical instruments taken during li liaisons with her plethora of lovers. Jonesy would also wander to wander to close by Brixton with its South Seas and Jamaican culture, picking up the core of his signature sound. His father passed away when he was 16 years old, leaving him and his sister in the hands of their aunt. At the age of 18, armed with a guitar and 200,000 pounds of his multi-million dollar inheritance, he left home for New York City, where he would soon find his fame. A serial womanizer and committed bachelor, to say it in the comments, I know a couple ladies know who I'm talking about with that one. <laughs> He had never been in love until meeting the teenage notorious Shayna. He was hooked on her like he had been heroin and alcohol, but he cleaned up his act enough to win the young lead singer over. He was 33 and Shayna 18 when they married. His mother would show up once she realized her son's fame and fortune and become a devil in the fight against Shayna and after Jonesy's sudden, what, did, what happened to Jonesy? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. Okay, so next character. Highball. Hyacinth Elizabeth Montgomery St. Jones, younger half sister of Jonesy's James. Olive skinned and blonde, cornflower, blue eyed beauty who favored women but liked to the overpowering feel of a man. Her nickname came from Shana Stevens after a particular hard night of booga sugar and naked bodies all over the floor rolling over random each other happily. I have to watch certain words. All right. She was only two when her mother, Belinda, second wife of Hugo, Hugo St. Jones, passed away in a car wreck and was raised with her much older, 12 years difference, half brother and mostly busy father. Two years later, they would lose their father. Their aunt was their only female influence and occasionally came bearing stories of sexual liberation and women's rights. Shy but strong and comfortable in her own skin, Hyacinth could be fearless but level-headed about her approach. Picked up the, she picked up the guitar at age 18 and at age 15 during an affair with her brother's band's drummer, Colt Howard. 
Her first female lover would happen during her A-levels at school. A prom promising student with a danger dangerously daring edge. At 15, Highball would seduce her young math skills teacher's assistant, who they are the same age. We've all been teacher's assistants in high school. Just throwing that in there. Uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. And Highball would seduce her young math skills teacher during an after-class tutoring session. They would be lovers for a year before being found out by the headmaster and torn apart by the scandal. She meets Shayna soon after, dur soon after during a visit to her brother's New York City home. Shayna was singing kar karaoke at Tequila Sunrise in Times Square, a small ba bar that attracted many local music busy heavyweights and talent to turn an A and R guy's ear. Now, the Tequila Sunrise, if you watch the Bad Girls in the Big Apple about Marie and I ditching Def Leppard and partying with the club kids and hanging out with Duran Duran and doing all kinds of crazy stuff for three weeks in New York City. Tequila Sunrise was a real place, and it was a real karaoke place, and there were some amazing singers. And yes, A&R people would go there. But for karaoke night, it was just astounding, and it happened a couple times while we were there. The, and Tequila Sunrise was where we would start out our nights in New York for that. So there's you can see a lot of the different things I'm amalgamating from reality into the book. Okay. Highball never used her brother's fame to help out her own. She was independent and single-minded. She had to be with, up, with her upbringing, which was spent mostly on her own after her father dies and brother left. Her aunt was there, but busy with, with either one cause or another, and possibly some lover of whichever gender she craved at the moment. A year after the teaching scandal, Highball left, left to New York City and finds her rock and roll destiny in the band Nancy Pants, but not before becoming a top groupie with Shayna and jumping from rock star to rock star and some of their wives. High stands behind Shayna after her arrest, but still struggled, struggles with her beloved brother's issues. What are those issues? Don't know. Alone in the world besides her aunt, High turns to drummer Colt for support. He finds herself, High finds herself in a place she never thought she would be, in love. She denies herself the relationship in an effort to focus on Shayna. Eventually, High leans on Colt after the long years and stays with him. All right, and the main character, Shayna Stevens, real name, Shayna Marin Brokowski, a small town girl, the youngest of five children and a relative hermit to, to her room and her music. Severely shy most of her, her young days, she finds boldness and freedom in the 45 records blasting out of her record player. If you remember those, oh, we loved our 45s. Okay, where was I? Sheltered but strong and determined to live her life, Shayna is sweet but defensive. Deep brown hair, tanned by the tanned by the pool, skin, and emerald green eyes. She is an individual stunner that holds her own among the men. Picked on and awkward, she leaves home at the age of 16. Her parents fought all the time and divorced. She was to go with her sister and mother across the country. So she runs away to New York City, and after hooking up with a few rock stars for a place to sleep, she finds a small one, which you guys know, in Seattle. And if we weren't hooking up with the rock stars for a place to sleep, we knew all the rock stars we were hanging out with, but we just took their hotel room keys. So if you guys read the book and you know anything about my first trip to Seattle, here's more of that reality. Okay. Hooking up with rock stars for a place to sleep, she finds a small one-room apartment in an old squat she could mostly be safe in. Using the one thing she had, her vivacious and unique voice, Shayna sings in a couple of wedding bands to make ends meet. She meets Patrick Brandt, infamous band manager, during a night of karaoke in a dive bar in Times Square. The same night, she meets up with an English girl that would help unlock so much of her destiny. Highball, as she would be called, would become her band's drummer and her personal oh, drum, blah, blah, would become her band's bass player and her personal partner in crime. 
Not to mention, some time later, her sister-in-law. Jonesy James was many years older than her and many years into his mega fame when she met him. Barely 17 and experienced beyond her years, Shayna took the notorious womanizer and confirmed Bachelor by surprise when her, be when her band became the opening act for, act for his festival tour across Europe and ma married him merely days after the three-month tour ended. Nancy Pants was a group of very well-known rock and roll groupies turned rock star nymphs. The hottest thing on the Billboard charts, charts, they came into their own with the rebellious attitude only teenage sluts can harbor and the tribal yell of their lead singer, Shayna. Sorry, I had to pause because I my allergies are just so, as you can tell, sinuses. Okay, next character, Aunt Margaret. Full name, Margaret Elizabeth Ann St. Jones, wayward but loving aunt of Jonesy James and Highball. She left home at the age of 20 when her father began bringing prospective husbands around. Independent and fierce yet feminine and ladylike. Despite having two sisters, her younger brother Hugo was her closest confidant and one true friend throughout her life. Always maintaining close contact, she would periodically come home to the house in which they were raised after her parents' death. After leaving home as a young girl, Margaret made the social circles around Europe and America. Known as the beauty of her time and mostly eccentric, she took on an independent at the an, indep an independence at the time reserved only for men. She seduced many men, including her counterparts' husbands, and became ostracized to the ironclad circles of men's parlors and secret poker games. Even with that said, her family history and money made her a top name on any social event guest list. So we're kind of following the Victorian age here, you know, the follow-up of that, but... Okay. Peppering the conversation and night with stories of her travels, Mar Margaret would bask in the attention centered on her from the men. The women would, co would act coldly, gracefully while gossiping behind their fluttering fans. Nonetheless, she would leave behind, she would leave behind one scene for another before needing to refresh her cash and having to go home to her brother, whom had been left as executor of her portion of the inheritance. Because, ladies, we couldn't even buy a house till the 1970s. We couldn't have a credit card without a man. Till the 70s. Let's keep that in mind. All right. Hugo gave anything to his beloved sister freely as long as she stayed at least a month so he could live through her stories and his children could have a colorful, womanly influence. After her brother's bath, Passing, she came home to roost and to be surrogate mom to James and Hyacinth. She took the children on little adventures around her social world and helped broaden their horizons. She was behind both James and Hy when they chose their rock and roll careers and on the side of the stage for both, mostly Hy, since she did become the appointed guardian of the under underaged band. She became Shayna's advocate and spent much of her own money helping her when she needed it most. She would eventually find out the truth of her nephew, nephew's issues. And that affected Shayna. Again, I'm not going to tell you what I wrote because I want to keep that kind of secret. She would eventually find out the truth of her nephew's issues. Oh, Shayna and Aunt Margaret would be close until the day she died. Highball would immortalize her beloved aunt in the song that brought Nancy, pa Nancy Pants back to their former glory. All right. What do you think so far? Okay. So, Mindy Bits. Mindy Bits. Sorry if my nose is stuffy, if I'm not sounding perfectly okay. Okay, Mindy Bits. Real name, Melinda Felicia Brandt. California girl with hazel eyes and perfect curves. Kind of glamorous tomboy in a skirt. Daughter of legendary rock manager Patrick Brandt. Peter Grant Brandt. And, you know, there's a lot of different brands in the business. The first guitar she strum, strummed belonged to blues legend B.B. King. Taking up the instrument at the age of six, her father and free-spirited mother encouraged the talent they saw, and when old enough, they pushed her to sing and strum on any stage they could get. 
By the time she was 12, her father began looking for other talented young girls with a band in mind. Independent and usually alone due to her parents' constant touring schedule, Mindy, Mindy naturally connected with the many rock stars that followed her father home. They adored her as a little girl, but when she started to develop at the age of 18, many of the rockers she grew up with began pursuing her secretly. She lost her V to the amazingly talented bass player of Jonesy James's band, Gunk. That's the name of, the, of his band, Gunk. Which, Gunk is actually the name of this roadie that I knew for a lot of years who was a good friend. So, any roadies watching? Chorus? Gunk. He was a very, very cool guy. We miss him. He passed away, unfortunately. Leaving home in the middle of the night, um... Mindy, oh, da, 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 where am I? Mindy went out on the road with Gunk for three months before he left her in New York City to fend for herself. Her talent was discovered after her lover, after her lover Gunk was too drugged out to play, so she silently strapped on his bass guitar and walked out onto the stage. She quick, oh no, Gunk is the bass player of Jonesy's band. What the fuck is his band? Huh. Guess I haven't figured that one out yet. Okay. You can tell it's been several years since I read this because it really has been. Like I said, it's I started this 10 years ago. Okay. Da, 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 da. She walked out on stage. She quickly became known as a musical genius and a force to be reckoned with. Too stubborn to return home after Gunk left her for highball, she found a squat to rent where she met Shayna. They wrote songs together late into the night and during the days per pursued the backstage life, becoming, par uh, becoming part of a very coveted groupie pack with Shayna. Future Nancy drummer, future Nancy Pants drummer Candy Sparks and Highball. They would eventually form Nancy Pants and her father would manage them. Never into heavy drugs or drinking, Mindy would be the solid foundation to the band when the rest of the girls were running around for days playing the band game. She kept track of all the business side and made sure they never got ripped off. But she did eventually fire her own father in favor of Trident Media. When I, um, was first shopping my book, We've Got Tonight, I had an agent, Scott Miller, with Trident Media, out of New York. Yeah. Okay, fired her father in favor of Trident Media, knowing it would be a prudent and smart financial move that saved all the girls from going broke. Okay, so, and, uh, Mindy Bits would become the guitar player, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm reading, if I remember correctly. I don't think I put that in there, but Mindy Bits, because she was so talented, she could play any musician, any um, instrument, which pretty much was John Entwistle. All right. Candy Sparks, real name, Candle Candace Emily Mayweather Sparks. Black-haired, exotic beauty with sapphire blue eyes, well-educated and traveled daughter of wealthy investment banker Carl Sparks and publisher Mary Mer Marilee Mayweather Sparks. Smart yet easily born and homeschooled. Her tutor was a music aficionado and brought in the drums as a way to engage Candy when she got distracted. She fell in love with the drums and found session work haphazardly by the age of 12, making commercial jingles thanks to her well-connected and encouraging mother. Close to her father but not around him often due to his travels, Candy became full of wanderlust early, and early on and at the age of 15 with permission and her mother's American Express card, she ran away from home when she met Gaz, well-respected Irish guitar phenomenon of Jonesy James's band. She would meet Mindy Bits backstage with Gaz. Not a big drug doer or drinker, Candy is outgo outgoing and alluring in a crowd, but nonchalant about her beauty, knowing it is her intelligence and inner beauty that will take her farther in life. She is a man's woman, being the only two girls in a sea of men, the two quickly bonded, highballing her. Had a late night jam session and talked about forming a band one day. But being the arm candy of some of the world's most desires rockers at the moment took priority. Candy would meet Shana through another rocker she started dating 
during a brief hiatus from Gaz. She knew Highball through her brother and eventually met Shayna backstage. When the four got together, she knew they would become one of the world's best female bands. She could feel the kismet. She and Mindy took most of the financial and business control, while Shayna and Highball took the publicity. After Shayna was accused, she... Um, Candy begrudgingly distanced herself from the singer and the band, returning to her role as Gaz's girl once again. Minus the brief hiatus when she met Shayna, Candy and Gaz had stayed together together all the years and have one of the longest, most respected rock and roll marriages. They would go on to have two sons, three cats, a dog, six state-of-the-art recording studios, and many industrial rental properties. The couple always remained mo mostly faithful and steadfastly devout, devoted not to only their family, but to their music. So, kind of taking a little twist. I, I'm not sure I'm getting everything completely coordinated here, but like I said, I haven't, read, I haven't really read this since I kind of wrote it. That's starting in 2014. All right. I think we might make this the last character. Let me see here. Oh, yeah, there's quite a... God, I really went to town. All right. So, let's see. Where are we? Do, 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 do. Okay, now we're going to go to Gaz, which Gaz is kind of a slang term for Gary. And Gary Lightbody, lead singer, Snow Patrol. Gaz. So that's kind of where I got that name. Okay, real name, Montgomery Garland Howard Townsend Smith. Because uh, Jonesy James's band, they're all English. They're all rock stars and English rock stars. So we all know how English guys can have like 12 different middle names. Kiefer Sutherland. Tall, dark-haired, and green-eyed, poetically handsome, grew up in Bridgenorth in Shropshire, the west mids of England, where his parents migrated from an uneasy IRA-occupied Northern Ireland. Here, he would watch the greats of the era like, Ros like Robert Plant and Ozzy Osbourne rise from the brummy ashes and into the international rock stardom. He took on the nickname Gaz from his humorous father who thought none of his names fit his personality. He was got taught guitar by his musical mother along with many other instruments such as the piano and French horn. John Entwistle. His father was a modest butcher shop owner but kept the family comfortable enough to pay for his son's early entrance into the London Music Academy, London Music Academy at the age of 15. There, Gaz learned everything he could strum and in every fashion that could be strummed. His genius was noticed not only by his instructors but also by the famous rockers he worshipped. By the age of 17, Gaz was doing guitar session work on Abbey Road and writing many of the best-known riffs of the time. Many manager and managers and record companies courted the young phenomenon, phenom, but he was not into being the center of attention. Quiet and modest in his talent, he wanted not only the touring and the fame, but also the camaraderie of the band and a union. He met Jonesy St. James. He met James St. Jones. At a, pub, at a pub in New York City after a session with David Bowie. They had a mutual friend that showed up and introduced them and thought it would be great idea, a great idea for them to start a band. James was a well-known singer about the scene who do, did back up for a few of the same pop stars that Gaz had done work with. They bonded over their shared view of Malcolm McLaren and the Sex Pistols. They could do better. So they did. He married his London sweetheart, Kay, at the age of 19. Their daughter, Anushka, was born six months later. After years of fame and being constantly faithful husband to his rather unsatisfied wife, Gaz met a young, black-haired beauty by the name of Candy. She was looking, and black-haired, that's not me. The women I just sort of made up. But I, I think Candy is more, you know, that deep, exotic, beautiful girl for me. I, I don't... Yeah. Okay. He wasn't looking for anything, but after years of being degraded by his spoiled wife, he needed something to make him feel off stage like he did when he was on it. Candy was a breath of fresh air, and after one night with her, he went 
to her parents and asked for her to be by his side. He lied and said he was in the middle of a divorce. Candy was allowed to go with him after she cried enough to wear down her open-minded parents. After being uh, photographed at the Rainbow in L.A., Candy and Gaz became the fodder of many gossip scandals and the center of his nasty divorce. He was 30 and Candy was 19 by the time they were found out, two years into their relationship, and one into the, her infamous band's rise to fame. They will, they will stay together and married for the rest of their lives and co-write two of her band's biggest hits. Gaz was torn after his singer's issues and believed that a drunk and heartbroken Shayna couldn't have been the cause of those issues. His devotion and loyalty to his wild and wayward lead singer stayed true all the while. His wife disagreed, disagreed, but put a distance between her and her lead singer out of loyalty to her family and husband. They would both mostly retire from, mu from live music and the rock scene after the issues. It would only be after Shayna would come out of musical seclusion that they would meet up again. All right, let's see here. Okay, so I think this is the last character I'm going to read. There's still a couple, but like I said, I want this to kind of be a two-parter so I can read kind of the first little bit of the first chapter for you guys. Okay, so next character, Colt Howard. Real name, Callum Marcus Jonathan Howard. Dirty brown hair, longer than most women's. Dark eyes and a sinister edge tempered by a shy side. Early life mate and school chum of Jonesy James. The two bonded early on, being a handful of old family money in the Clapham end of London. Music, freedom to travel the world, and of course the devout adoration of the female persuasion brought them together. As youth... As youths, God, sounded like Cousin Vinny, as youths, the two boys would sneak into different clubs around London where they would watch bands like Iron Maiden, Saxon, and Motorhead. Colt took up the drums after stealing a full kit from the Sex Pistols basher Paul Cook. Okay, Steve Jones. Naturally, naturally and immensely talented, Colt quickly set, set the for what he would Set the I don't know what I was trying what I missed quickly set the something set the scene for what would become the band's signature rhythm. Both Colt and Jonesy lost their V's to schoolmates to a schoolmate's mother after a day spent drinking and drugging. The story would become the first hit for their future band. They both ran away to America oh no, Colt ran away to America penniless with Jonesy James, where he held odd jobs and went for Went to the corner when desperate for cash. That's kind of the Dee Dee Ramone thrown in there. Colt would steal money from Jonesy for drugs and several girls' procedures. Wow, I just went to town. I'm not fucking around with this stuff, am I? This would, this would end their friendship for a time. Colt was saved by teen queen of the groupies and sister to his lost friend, Highball. She took him in and set him up with some studio work with a female lead singer Hi had once had an illicit affair with. She was responsible for getting Jonesy and Colt reunited. Jonesy introduced Gaz and Colt, who never really got along but understood the chemistry and talent they each contributed. Colt would bring phenom bass player Gunk into the fold to finish off the band. A womanizer and a road dog, Colt had more groupies than all the other members combined. He had three daughters with different groupies, all accidental and all groupies under, okay, I don't know what I was saying there, but he truly and secretly loved one woman his whole life. From the second he met her, he knew she could be the only one for him. Highball. But she was untamable. Or was she? After Jonesy issues, he would console her and be there the way she had been for him all the years before the two. The two would eventually settle into their swinging world and spend their lives arguing, fucking, and generally loving each other until the day they were killed in a stage collapse. What? 
I killed him? Oh, no. Okay, I might change that. I think I might have already changed that. <laughs> I don't want them to die. When their bodies were found underneath the rubble, they were still holding hands. Okay, at least it ends romantically. Okay, let's see. I think we have time for one more. Yep, one more. Gunk. Real name, Michael Andrew Howerwitz. Average height, dirty blonde hair, green blue eyes, rugged and refi refined like Robert Redford. Most musically talented musician of his time. Innovator and genius. Likes a good stout and a fat line. Born in upstate New York, Gunk left a strict Hasidic Jewish family at the age of 15 after an argument with his father for touching their hair. And boobs of his cousin. The hell? <laughs> I'm not sure what I was smoking when I was writing this. Okay. He played intricate bass riffs no one had ever dared to try on, on a bass in Times Squares for pennies a day. So he was busking, basically. And, you know, of course, the bass, the talent, John is, and whistle all the way. Da, 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 da. Where am I? He was found by Colt Howard when they were both living in a Bronx squat known as harbor as a as a, known to harbor runaway teens. Fighter by fighter by the elements he ran to, Gunk got his nickname after punching a homeless man for his half eaten sandwich and finding some rather odd meat between the moldy bread and eating it anyway. He took up bass so he could get laid at bar mitzvahs. He began rebelling around ten years old and when his own when his old Ten years old, when his father decided not to spare the rod in reaction to his son's love for all things rock and roll. Years later, he runs to New York City when a friend's older brother told him about places like Max's and CBGB's. CBGB's. His mother, being a kind and secretly supportive woman, bought him a bass and gave Gunk a thousand dollars, telling him to find his dreams and not be stuck in the dismal existence she committed to. He finds work being a, by being a trash boy on a construction site and moves into his own basement flat in the Bronx, three blocks away from the flat where Jonesy and Colt lived. He runs into them, trying to steal his amps, and beats Colt before inviting them in for some drugs and a visit to the town hooker down the hall. Hardworking and deeply contemplative, he magically loses himself in the base, making it cry, laugh, and tell you its life story all at the same time. Gunk would bring the most hypnotic element to the band. Never married and a confirmed bachelor, he keeps three women in five houses around the world, one of them being label exec Nicola Inez. The woman he really loved, even though she swore she would never be committed to a musician, even after having his only child. He stayed out of the fight, he stayed out of the fight after Shana and secretly writes his longtime friend religiously during her years dealing with issues he and Nic nicola throw her the first big party when she comes back to life they help shana by retrieving her jewelry jewelry from where cousin petey hid it and give her a, ref a refuge from the overwhelming press until she can sneak out of town gunk dies three years after in a racing accident his son with nicola Ab abijah abijah and Abijah is actually my great-great-grandfather's name on my mother's side, her mother's grandfather. So his son with Nicola, Abijah, would eventually become, eventually becomes most celebrated opera tenor in the history of the genre. genre. Abijah begins a yearly racing charity in memory of his father and starts a home for throwaway and runaway kids. Okay, so wow. That, it's kind of interesting to really read that after all the these years of not reading it and kind of what I wrote. I'm kind of like, whoa. Not, I'm not impressed with myself, but I'm kind of impressed with myself. And I don't mean that like egotistical or anything, you know. So, yeah, you guys tell me what you think of all that down in the description. Tell me if that's the direction you want me to go with the book. Because I kind of get just a little more spark when I write that like I was writing we've got tonight and when you get that spark when you're writing 
that kind of tells you the direction you should be going. So because I do have another version of, you know, just the reality version, but I do kind of really like this a little better. But tell me what you guys think. Do you want it more reality, just kind of a follow up as to we got tonight? Or would you like it more the fictional characters based on my reality? But so as always, just want to say thank you to everybody to getting to the end of the end of this episode. Hope you really liked the reading. I hope my reading wasn't all over the place. But as you can tell, as I'm reading it, if you guys have read my book, there's quite a few elements that are real. So you're going to be able to tell, you know, what everything in here, the, the fights that may have happened, certain issues that will kind of come to light in the next reading. So, because I will make a part two, because like I said, I want to read kind of the first little bit that I have in the first chapter and then finish with a few of the other characters that are in the book kind of based on, because I've already kind of, Brought one of them out, Nicola, based on Andrea. Onyx in the book. So, Andrea was my friend who was with Mikey Inez. I, the night I was met, the night Vinnie Paul, Vincent Paul and I got together, I introduced her to Mikey Inez. So, Nicola Inez. So, there you guys go. Again, thank you for getting to the end of the episode. Hope you really like this. You know, it's really scary putting your own writing out there. But don't ever be afraid. For anybody else who is writing a book, don't ever be afraid. And write your characters first. Because I know there's one person here, Miss Gamer, <laughs> that you're going to write this. So, kind of build your characters first. And let their stories unfold. Kind of did in their description. So, all right, you guys. So I will see you next time when we're going to finish reading the rest of the characters. And the hi, Beluga. They're my kitty. And kind of let you have a little more insight into the direction I was taking this book. Everybody say hello, Belugas. Hi, kitty face. Look how cute he is. All right. Well, we will see you next time on Cocktails and Rocktails. Here's the ears. <laughs>